Hi everyone, in this video I'd like to introduce the motivation and idea of the method that was used in the proof of the existence and uniqueness of first order nonlinear differential equation in the standard form, very general proof. Remember, I, you probably have learned this first order not existence and uniqueness of the first order linear differential equation. That was done, and it's, uh, it's relatively easily using the integrating factors. The nonlinear is different, and that's um, this part is to introduce the idea and motivation, the idea behind the general proof of the nonlinear case. Let me first um, start with the method called Newton's method. This is usually introduced in the calculus one level, but it's very interesting and powerful. This is probably the first example they go through is computing the square root of 2. Suppose you don't know anything um, about calculus, anything that one method you will go about to compute the square root of 2 is the following. It's really about this two statement. Um, one way or another, you suppose you figured out square root of 2, it must be in 1 or 2. One way to actually algebraically prove is that you look at the squares of these three terms. So the squares are 1 squared and square root of 2 squared is 2, 2 squared is 4. So this statement is uh, easy to prove. To conclude, if this holds, which is what we have established, prove that hold, requires increasing property of the function square root of 2. The operation we're doing to the each of the term is the square root, and that preserves this inequality. Um, it means the function square root of x is increasing function. If your inputs are in this order, square root function preserve the out uh, the order of the size of the output that's exactly like this. So if you believe that this is valid method, you can conclude from here to there. If you have this statement, you can also conclude that. So relying on this idea, you can go further. And for example, if you know if it is in between 1 and 2, you can test if it is in between 1.1 and 1.2. So that can be verified by 1.1 squared, 1.2 squared. Like it's written here, you will try 1.1 squared, 1.2 squared, see if 2 is in between that two numbers. It's not. But by the time when you hit 1.4 and 1.5, then it is. Then you conclude square root of 2 must have this first decimal digit, 1.4. And you go to the next decimal digit and keep repeating this. Realize that 1.41 um, actually does work. And this is kind of the process similar to the process you do when you divide something. If you think about how to divide one number, one number by another, you do a lot of searching like this, which multiple of a divisor fits in, you know, perfectly and stuff like that. So this is requires a lot of testing. Um, just like I said in the division algorithm, you know that requires a lot of testing. So a uh, Newton's method uh, introduced an idea to compute the square root of two without even testing anything. It's just uh, put an uh, put forth algorithm. In, uh, com Compute the square roots really quickly without testing anything. If you have, have to implement computer algorithm to compute something like that, if it avoids testing, is extremely faster than the algorithm, it requires testings like this. So idea of the Newton's method goes follow. You look at the graph y equals x squared minus 2. Its x-intercept happened to be is actually the square root 2. So you start with a one guess. That requires a little bit of testing, but it's a one testing at the beginning. You start with this number, which is not square root of 2. Maybe it's 2. Then you go up and find the point in the function, y equals x squared minus. If it's a 2, that's going to be 4 minus 2. is going to be 2. Then draw this tangent line and find the next intercept. Then because of the shape of this concavity and increasing property, Newton thought, and this new x-intercept is way closer, uh, probably closer than this initial number. So you can repeat this process again. At that point, go up and find the x-y coordinate, draw the tangent line, 
and getting closer and closer. And intuitively, the concavity and the increasing property kind of guarantees that it's going to probably approach square root nicely. So you write down this as an algorithm. Xn, go up there and compute the equation of the tangent line and find the x-intercept. So if you have taken calculus 1, that it will be a fairly simple exercise. So this is the bottom line. If you skip that calculation, if you start with xn, compute the tangent line, and compute the x-intercept of the tangent line, that x-intercept is this formula. So we have a new x-coordinate xn plus 1. And from this observation, and this xn plus 1 is a closer to the square root of 2. It actually, if you do this algorithm, if you do um, start with a 2, and you compute this number, and you get something closer, and then use that and spit, um, put it in here again to renew that number and so on. This is called iteration. And this number actually goes to the square root of 2 really quickly. So let's make a comment about what we were doing before. We, it required a lot of testing. If you look at this procedure, there's no testing. If you have xn, you compute this one, you get a new number, you do this computation again with this output, and so on. So it's a pretty fast algorithm because it does not have any testing. So that's the comparison we'd like to make. make. Another comment I'd like to make, whenever I introduce Newton's method, I have to say this because this is a fascinating part of the Newton's method, is the following. At each iteration, it doubles the number of correct digits. Suppose we examined, then at one stage we have 10 correct digits. So you start from 1.4, and suppose we have 10 correct digits down to the decimal points. Then if you do this one iteration, in the next step, it gives you, it guarantees a 20 correct digits. If you do one more, it'll give you 40 correct digits, and so on. So if you actually do this experiment with computer software, it's kind of amazing to see how, how fast this approach is. Doubling the digits is, is just amazing phenomenon. Now we're about to do the, something that's similar to Newton's method. So there's no testing. We're just um, repeat this process, and then it gives you a, 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 a more and more correct solution to this differential equation. So I chose this particular example of uh, first order in standard form, nonlinear because of this y squared uh, differential equation with this initial condition. And let's think about how we're going to approach this problem. First method I introduced in my differential equation courses is using this analytic solution. This is a fancy name for a power series. Make sure that you understand there are functions out there that cannot be expressed as a power series form, but if you're looking for answers in the power series form, and it must look like this. I chose this x to the k not x, x minus 1 to the kth or x minus 2 to the kth because of this initial condition is at 0. So x minus 0 is simply x to the kth. So that's the motivation looking at this local analytic solution. From here is a fairly complicated arithmetic on the infinite series and it does not require any fancy um, knowledge on uh, high mathematics is just simple arithmetic and then you just have to be, be patient and and watch out the notation and stuff. So what I'm doing here is we have this fictitious solution and hypothetic solution here. Try to figure out if this satisfies this differential equation. What could be the condition that is imposed on this coefficient ak? This is the ingredients that completely determines this analytic function, analytic solution. So I differentiated this part. So if you differentiate that, and that's how the power series is differentiated, k comes down and x to k minus 1. And there's no derivative on the right-hand side. It's just arithmetic. And this is a part that has required a little bit of work, but I'll explain. So left-hand side is uh, the power series is slightly different. 
Now this is common technique, this re-index thing such that the power is a kth power, not k minus fourth power, so that you can compare with other power series uh, there that are shown here and and actually this part so that you can easily compare what could be the coefficient if I call that x to the kth. So you can write it out and you can easily rewrite it. You can see that um, comparison of this index and that is that this one is one lower or this is one higher index. So if I call that one x to the k, that should be the k plus 1 and these two things are the same, so k plus 1, that's one easy way to re-index it. First term here, k equals 0, is next down. That That's because, because k equals 0 here, but because the constant term is differentiated here and becomes 0. So it really starts from k equals 1. When k equals 0, that whole thing is a 0. And it's really starting from k equals 1. So um, when k equals 1, it's x to the 0th power. That's the beginning. So x to the 0th power, k equals 0, is the initial part. I missed the infinity symbol there. So that's left-hand side. is re-indexed. Now right-hand side is not re-indexed, but I'm going to do something about the square part. I mean, um, many of you probably have not seen the how to square an infinite series if it is in the power series form, and it is following is allowed. Not all infinite series can be written, can be treated as follows, but if it is in the power series form, um, it's okay to do this. So I'm writing these exactly the same thing two times. Doesn't look like the same thing. We have index L and index K, but these are just dummy variable to write this thing expanded. It doesn't matter if you use different variable and same variable. This is one quantity, different quantity, and you better write, distinguish these two different indices. I was lazy and didn't write down this part, but this part is the same. Right hand side is you have lots of sum, multiplied lots of sum. If you think about the distribution and how it's going to be distributed, we're going to multiply every single term in here to the every single term in there. So you multiply this and that, put together a k i l, x to the k, x to the l, and exponential law, it's simplified like this. And I forgot the double index here, so we go through all possibility of that and that and combined like this. So it's a, called a double sum. As if we're looking at two different integral, and if they're completely not related, especially in terms of this indices, you can just put it into a double integral. That's kind of the same idea. Idea of the next part is rewriting at, in terms of x to the some fixed power and the, what the coefficient is. So we have to think about this k plus l, k and l varies a lot, but there are certain pairs such that k plus l is fixed. For example, when n equals 5, you have lots of choices, 0 plus 5, 1 plus 4, 2 plus 3, 3 plus 2, and so on, all the way down to 5 plus 0. Those are the limited finite possibility for fixed n. So we're going to re-index this one with k plus n equals n and rewrite one of the variable k and l. So here I'm um, showing you that last bit again. So we're going to call that k plus l n. So here it is. That's the left hand side. Still didn't change. Right hand side, this whole thing is called n. And we can collect those when n equals 0, for example. That will be 0 plus 0. That's the only possibility when n equals 1 and so on. So we are reorganizing these terms in terms of k plus l being 0, k plus l being 1, and so on. So I re-index it. n starts from 0 to infinity, and that part is called x to the n. And when this one's k plus l is n, what's happening to that part is, for example, if I'm keeping this l and writing k in terms of um, other variable, which would be n minus l. So instead of k, I have n minus l. And L can vary from, vary from 0 to n, 0 to 0 to n there. And then it, it'll cover all the possibility of a k and L, that, such that k plus L 
becomes n. So it reorganizes like this. So there are n plus 1 term as a sum becomes the coefficient of x to the n in the right hand side. So the next part, I am because this uh, index for the x to the power is here n, so I'm switching this one to n, so it's just a dummy variable. And this is some special term out there and mess up um, the shape of the coefficient. So this is x to the first. So I'm separating x to the zeroth, x to the first here, and use this formula beginning with x equals uh, n equals 2, such that we have this nice formula not affected by whatever it's out there. So that's what I'm doing. x to the x is there, separating when n equals 0, when n equals 0, possibilities L0 to 0. So L is 0 and N is 0. A0, 0 is the only possibility for x to the 0. So A0 squared is the constant term of this one. When N equals 1, then L goes from 0 to 1. So it's a 1 minus 0. That's 1 minus 0. When L is 1, N is 1, then A0 minus A0, A1. So that's the coefficient of x to the first. For n, there are two terms, n plus one term. So n is one here, so there are two terms. So again, I'm separated those two terms because I see this x to the first here. Beginning with x, x n equals two here, this uh, shape is exactly the coefficient of x to the n because there's no other term is affecting this part. So I copy down this whole thing with beginning with n equals 2 and kind of have this special term. And we have to compare these two things. And I also have to compare, separate this n equals 0 and n equals 1 uh, to make this comparison. And that's what I'm going to do. So here I'm comparing constant term. Left hand side, a constant term is when n equals 0. So you can see 1 and a1. So that 1 times a1 is in the left hand side, a constant term. Right hand side, this is the only constant term, so a0 squared. So a0 is a given number, y of 0 was a0, so this is given. That determines what a1 value is because of this comparison. Let's look at the um, coefficient of x to the first in the left hand side. So when n equals 1, that's 2, that's a2, so it's a 2 times a2. Right hand side, there's a coefficient 1, and there's a 2 times a0a1. So 1 plus 2 times a0a1 is the coefficient of x in the right hand side. So coefficient of left, right, they should be the same. If you use the fact that a1 is a0 squared, so this becomes 2 times a0 to the third. So a2 is determined by in terms of a0, which is a0 is given. So a2 is a one-half of that, which is, I wrote it here, a2, we know now, one-half plus a0 cubed. Now, the rest of the part, we have a nice formula, the coefficients of x to the n when n is greater than or equal to 2. They have this nice formula. Left-hand side is simply n plus 1, a n plus 1. So the coefficient of x to the n on the left-hand side coefficient of x to the n and right hand side for n greater than or equal to 2 they must be equal to each other so if you solve for a n plus 1 that would be definitely 1 over n plus 1 and this whole sum so I'm going to expand this one and show you what's really involved in here when l equals 0 that will be a n a 0 so that's a n a 0 now l equals 1 a n minus 1 and a, a, a1. If you go all the way to the n, if you plug in n there, that's a0, and l n here, that's a n. So if you look at here, the first index is decreasing, the second index is increasing, and in all that, everything that is involved here is a n through a0. You don't see a n plus 1. So if you know a0 through a n, it completely determines a n plus 1. So here we know a0 and a1 is completely known. Therefore, a3 
is completely determined by this value a0, a1, a2. a4 is going to be completely determined by a0, a1, a2, a3 we just computed, and so on. So therefore, it leaves no room for what this coefficient should be. It completely determines every coefficient that is involved in the analytic solution. So this is a formula. If you make a comparison with Newton's method, every time you have this coefficient and plug it in there, it's a longer and longer calculation, but it, in terms of iterations, I think it's similar to Newton's method. More complicated and more computation is each step is involved, but it's iteration and requires no decision making or testing process, testing um, process, uh, testing part. It just takes long time to get this formula and each time the iteration gets more and more computation. I realized that I did the computation on A3, so let me show you that part. So when n equals 2, that's A3, so it picks up one third and starts from A2 and first indices is going down and second indices is going up. We have calculated all this A0, A1, and A2 earlier. If you plug those into that formula, we have this one showed up, shows up. Completely determined by A0 because all the preceding uh, terms are completely determined by A0. So we got this formula. If you think about it, that doesn't mean uh, this is really a solution. This is only a solution when the power series, the analytic solution, has a positive radius convergence. So if we can show, um, usually in this complicated formula, computing the exact radius of convergence is out of our reach. But one can show by just knowing the how fast this uh, coefficient is increasing, you can kind of show that there is at least a positive you know, radius of convergence, positive neighborhood around that x equals 0, so that this power series makes sense. I'm showing you my computation here, but I'm not going to explain a whole lot. I'm just going to explain the difficulty of doing this. I was partially um, succeeded to calculating the radius of convergence here. So I looked at the formula. I used very rough estimates of um, this long sum. There are n plus 1 terms. We don't know anything about all these things. So I used this maximum to get a rough estimate. So this mn is the maximum values of this each of the ANs from um, AKs here, ALs. And I get this rough estimate. Turns out each of the term AN plus 1 is less than the square of the maximum of uh, preceding terms. That's rough estimate of how this one is growing. So when I assume that the very first term, M2, is less than 1, we can show this A3 and A4 are always less than M2 squared. So this is not growing at all. Therefore, if the coefficient is not growing fast, you can easily conclude that it has a positive radius of convergence. But that number is greater than or equal to 1. If this begins to grow, then I have no control on how fast it's growing. So I don't have a quick uh, answer to that part. And kind of understanding this dealing with this radius of convergence is difficult, is important for um, to appreciate uh, this method we are about to introduce that is used in the proof of the existence and the uniqueness of the first order nonlinear differential equation in standard form. Without being this picky about those radius of convergence, often um, we just take this as analytic solution as a sufficient um, answer to something. But uh, right now, um, in terms of uh, logic and completeness, it's incomplete to conclude in here. Even for that specific example, this is not a general discussion. Now, this is a beginning to make the um, beginning of the actual method, but um, comparing this method 
with the usual power series method, it's important to, to understand this power of this um, kind of usefulness of this idea. The original equation is given in differential form, but by hitting both sides with the integral operator, you can change to an integral equation, not differential equation. It turns out it makes huge difference. That's kind of strange, though. So this is differential equation y prime equals x plus y x squared and have initial condition. This seems like the same thing, y equals this power series. And we go up to just n, so this is called a Taylor polynomial. So notice that this stopped at n and the rest of the part continues with n plus first power. So I call that polynomial Tn rest of the part, which is not a polynomial, it's a still an infinite series, I'm going to call that one Rn. But Rn starts with a correct um, n plus first uh, power term of this solution. So again, this is a fictitious solution. This is just to explain the idea um, using this integral equation rather than differential equation. So here, before we have this differential equation y prime and x plus y x squared, but I hit both sides with this integral operator, 0 to x, and with the integral variable t. By fundamental theorem of calculus, left-hand side, of course, becomes antiderivative, which is y x minus y 0. Right-hand side stays like this. By initial condition, y0 is a0, and you can put that one on the other side, so that becomes a0 plus this integral term. So that differential equation is equivalent to this integral equation, yx equ is equal to a constant a0 plus this integral of this function itself. And if y, yx is analytic uh, function, then you can write it as you up to the nth power term plus rest of the power series, and nth power term plus rest of the power series. If you look at this expression, something interesting happens. So I'm going to expand this one. If you um, expand out, we have Tn squared and Rn squared and 2 times Tn and Rn. This thing is exactly that. Notice that Rn starts from x to the n plus 1, and Rn, of course, squared is going to be even higher term, and Tn has x to the n. So although I wrote it starts from x to the n plus 1, uh, it actually starts a lot higher. But this is sufficient. This b can be 0. It actually starts from a lot higher power. But that the point is that this one had to starts, uh, has power at least x to the n plus 1. So that part's written up here now. So I want you to watch out here. This is interesting part. Um, I separated this two integral. So this one showed up as an integral here. But this one, it starts from x to the n plus 1. Think about, I have this power series in here. You're going to integrate this one always with the uh, term by term. So the first term integral is going to be x to the n plus 2, um, n plus 2 in the denominator. And the rest of the part has even higher power, so you can see everything in here has a higher power. So it's after integrated. We're not integrating this part, we're leaving it um, as it is. In the left-hand side, I'm noticing that up to here is the correct uh, power series, up to n. And this begins with the correct n plus first power series. And if you look at the right hand side, this doesn't have n plus first power series. If uh, And these two things are equal to each other. So there must be um, right hand side, because these two things are equal to each other, the coefficient of x to the n plus 1 is the correct coefficient for the answer. And right hand side, this one does not have x to the n plus 1. So no matter what comes out of this one, had the correct um, coefficient of x to the n plus 1. This is amazing. If you look at it here, tn squared here, that doesn't have a n plus 1. It only has a 0 to a n, a n. 
But if you go through this calculation, it's going to spit out a correct AN plus 1 because it's not going to be affected by this one. No matter what you get for the coefficient of x to the n plus 1 from this calculation must be the correct Taylor term, correct power series term. So I summarize it here. Because, because left-hand side has this correct um, x to the n plus first term, this part must pick up the correct Taylor series, Taylor polynomial up to the n plus first power because they, it, it appeared in, correctly in left-hand side and this one doesn't have that n plus first power. Of course it doesn't stop at n plus first power because it's squared it's gonna give us a lot longer term so we don't know about the correctness of this term but we know this is exactly correct if we just look at this part. If you take this junk term together with that part it should all work out as a correct rest of the part in here. But if you just look at this part, this just spits out n plus first correct terms up to the n plus first power. If you think about it, this is really interesting. So let me summarize it here. Not knowing that what the correct answer, our n part is, if we just know Tn, if you stick it into this formula, which is completely known, what's going to give us is that it's going to give us the correct n plus 1 first the Taylor polynomial plus a little bit of junk term. Just like a Newton's method, if you go through, it gives you a, at least one more term that is correct and rest of the part um, is, is unknown. The correctness is not known. So next idea is that what if we did something like this uh, Newton's method don't care about up to which, it, you know, just selecting this one, take this whole thing and plug it in here and do it again and see if we can get another correct um, power series term. So that's what I'm going to explain next. So here I summarized it again. We have, suppose we have correct um, Taylor polynomial. Now this is right hand side of the differential equation, not the differential equation, the integral equation. Let me show you that integral equation. So here's the integral equation y x is left hand side and right hand side is like this a0 plus this integral plus t plus yt. We don't know the yt but suppose we have tn instead of evaluating this one at the solution yt we're actually doing just with a truncated answer Taylor polynomial n. Stick it in there. An early discussion, what we concluded is that um, what is supposed to happen is that it spits out the correct t plus tn plus 1, the power series up to n plus 1 power, plus um, the higher power, which is it starts from n, n plus 2 power, and it is not necessarily correct. So by doing that iteration, we get one more correct term. Next thing we're going to do is rather than just selecting this one and then put it back in here, that because of the earlier discussion, it's going to give you Tn plus 2 plus um, incorrect terms. But rather than separating and selecting it, why don't we just take this one, which is output of this process, just stick it all the way back in here. Does that still give us to one more correct term? And that's the question to answer. So if you do it that way, this process is kind of convenient, although we're dealing with a longer and longer term, but it's kind of convenient to formulate, and it is very nice to use that um, formulation to prove anything theoretically that doesn't involve selecting this part and doing it again. That's kind of a natural algebraically. So we're going to take that and stick it in here and see if it still gives you a better terms. That's what I'm doing here. So this is what I got out of this process. So without thinking about up to what is the correct, we're going to stick back into this process again. Hopefully it spits out Tn plus 2 and the incorrect terms. If that's true, it's going to be a really convenient process. You just keep doing that without thinking about anything, selecting anything. It's just, it just gives you more and more correct terms. So I'm doing the same thing I did with Rn. I'm just going to square this one and separate it here. Rest of the term as you square this one has a 2 times this Tn1, 
q plus q squared. It ends at x to the n plus 1, so this one starts from x to the n plus 2, and it's even higher power, so this whole thing starts with x to the n plus 2 with some coefficient. This b is not the same b that I talked about before. It's just a shape. Now if you integrate it, this one will start with n plus 3. So here, by earlier discussion, this will give you correct n plus um, correct uh, answer up to the x to the n plus 2 here, and will give some incorrect answer. And this part will give you an n plus 3 power and, and so on. So this starts with n plus 3 and that starts with n plus 3. Adding these two things it's not going to affect that part. And we don't have any conclusion about whether this addition of this thing is correct or not. It's probably not. Because we already lost that Rn part. And Q is it's a bit and pieces of Rn, so this is absolutely incorrect, probably. But we guarantee that none of the x n, n plus 2 is here, so that's not going to mess up a n plus 2. So we guarantee that by doing this process, we still pick up one more correct term. So again, the advantage of this one is um, convenience of a formulation. You stick in a tn, you got something out that has a correct x to the n plus 1 term, and you do this again, it guarantee that it's going to give you the correct x to the n plus 2 terms. And if you stick it in here again, it's going to give you one more correct term and so on. So the process is simple, and it guarantees that one at a time, it'll give you more and more correct terms. So here I'm just simply, I would say this is a simple uh, procedure, so I'm actually describing whatever all the motivation I gave you before. I'm just simply um, describing the procedure simple as the Newton's method. We start with the very first term of the Taylor series, which is labeled as y0. And if you have y0, you go through that in the right-hand side of the integral equation, then you get a new function. Just like Newton's method, we take that back in and here, get another function, and so on. We keep doing that. Then doing by doing this procedure, we'll pick up one at a time one more correct terms and one more correct terms in the Taylor series. So that's the procedure. I'm showing you our calculation um, with this differential equation, not the integral equation. Before we found a1 was a0 squared and a2 was a2 is 1 half plus a0 cubed. So if you stick that one in here, if you go through this integral um, operation, and it's supposed to give you a uh, correct first term. So y1, when n equals 0, is a0 plus this one with the y0 in there. So t plus y0 is the constant function a0. Let's take it in there. So its antiderivative is 1 half t squared. a0 squared t evaluated 0 and x. So a0 is there. And this will give you half times x squared and that'll give you a0 squared x in there. So this is the correct constant term of the Taylor series, and this is the first uh, degree 1, x to the first coefficient a0 squared, that matches our finding here. Let's, let's do one more time and see if that we pick up this part. So we have this y1 has a three terms, as I said it before, this gets longer and longer. In practice, is not very ideal, but the description of these process is so simple, so it's theoretically, it's easy to deal with. So that's why we're focusing on this one here. So y1, you have to square the whole thing. So I did the algebra. So actually square this whole thing, and you have this lots of terms. Maybe you may pause the video if you want to really see how this works out. You have to multiply this three term to itself and expand it out and see. Uh, you get something like this, um, like I did. All right, um, I hope it's not too confusing. I wrote it down. I, I squared the three term y1 t. So I got this one. And I have to uh, kind of simplify and put this all um, the common terms together. It turns out like this, y2x is a0 
inside this is the constant term and this wiggly part is the two um, parts we teach the first and this double lines are the only term with the t squared and teach the third is the only term and teach the fourth there so I collected it degree 4 polynomial so you integrate each of the monomial and it looks like this that's a 0 squared and if you integrate that part you'll pick up half times x squared this one will give you a third times x squared this is supposed to be x cubed sorry about that and this is going to be 1 fourth x to the fourth and this is going to be 20 times x to the fifth so that's the result of this integration y2 will have these long terms but we started from y1 that has up to the correct um, x to the first power and then it's supposed to be supposed to give us the correct x to the second term here so this bottom part here highlighted that shows you the correct second coefficient which is exactly this half times 1 times a 0 cubed so that picked up the correct um, coefficient for x to the squared now if you do this one more time again it's longer and longer term but that's going to give you degree 3 part so it's theoretical it's very interesting if by going through this uh, simple iteration it gives you one correct answer at a time it's very convenient to describe let me kind of summarize what I was asserting and I think I almost uh, kind of proved that what I'm asserting here this is how I started we're going to assume that y prime is uh, assume this differential equation with this initial condition has an analytic solution so that it looks like this and we define this iteration y um, define y0 is the constant term a0 that's the initial condition and you go through this iteration came out of um, integral equation yn you go through this calculation define that as yn plus 1x then this yn is a polynomial of course we started with this going through this very specific uh, integral equation then this polynomial will look like this and this is n nth function it doesn't mean this degree is n as you square this one you have more and more term longer and longer but up to this x to the n plus 1 x to the n, excuse me, is has a correct answer and beginning with x to the n plus 1 is not correct but if you do this again it's going to give us another correct answer to the a n plus 1. So that's pretty much um, what I have uh, proved. And this is a very special example but um, if you look at different types of function even if you use a sine and cosine anything that you can kind of write it as in, in um, as a power series in terms of t and y this argument I just showed is easily generalized so that you can conclude something like this so this kind of gives you the motivation of considering this thing if I have first term why don't I stick it in there and keep getting the you know more and more term if this is transcendental in nature not like the polynomial like this you're not going to get a nice polynomial but um, theory guarantees that it's going to be a good solution to that but here all in that it, it, this a proof of this idea here uses assumption on an analytic solution but it turns out this idea itself does not require any analytic solution if you actually do this one some, some miracle happens that's the theorem I'd like to introduce here now here's the general formulation and I'm about to introduce this general um, theorem so we're looking at this standard form equation left hand side is a derivative and right hand side is a function that involves x and y as a two independent variable here's an example early example right hand side was x plus y squared so I want you to look at this as just two independent variable and when you fit into this part y becomes a function of x but this expression itself you can look at it as a two variable expression where x and y are both independent and it's this is differential equation using that expression and here's the initial condition 
and we turn that into this integral equation, not differential equation. And using this integral equation, and we can um, assert existence and uniqueness of this differential equation, which is equivalent to this um, integral equation. Of course, there's got to be some condition about the right-hand side of here. The condition, which is accessible to us, um, this level is that this two-variable function is continuous, and the partial derivative, if you have taken a calc 3 or at least elementary functions, this has been introduced in our differential equation courses or in calc 3. After you computed this uh, partial derivative, that should remain continuous. So we're talking about a continuity of a two-variable function. That's a bit tricky, but if you just uh, stay in the world of elementary function, these are the mostly satisfied locally. And this theorem concerns the existence and uniqueness of a solution to this differential and integral equation and existence, and you have to show how to construct that um, solution. And it is not some exact method, but by doing this iteration, this is the initial condition a0, and we set this first function y0 to be a0. And this is the integral, um, came from the integral um, equation, and we stick this y0 in, in here, and get y1. We use that y1 in here to get y2, and so on. In that process, this is not necessarily a polynomial expression. could be transcendental and rational. And these yn's that we're constructing is far from being a polynomial or Taylor polynomial, something like this. But it is motivated from that example. What happens if we actually do that, even though we don't get the poly um, Taylor polynomials. If you keep repeating like this, what's going to happen? This iteration is called Picard iteration. First part of the theorem says, if I keep repeating this, the values of these function values don't go crazy. That actually, well, locally, um, for every x value here given, if you just look at these different function values as we iterate, they always exist. Um, technical words are convergence, so they converge all the time um, around at x equals c value. That's what I mean by locally. That's a miracle, actually, but not much of a condition here. If you compare it with the condition it's given in the Taylor series, it's a lot more complicated than that in this. It's a lot simpler. The second part is that this function um, constructed this way, very abstractly, the convergent, thing, convergent function satisfied this differential equation, and hence this satisfied this integral equation. So we found a function, that function happened to satisfy the differential equation. So up to here, prove the existence. And using the same method that is involved in here, same method that is involved in here, you can show that the function we constructed is the actually the only solution. So this is a uniqueness. So the proof of this um, statement is actually quite accessible to us. It's just the long, and you have to, to look at the details one at a time, but every bits and pieces inside the proof of this one is accessible to us. But um, I'll stop this part of the video in here and continue the proof in the next part of the video.